Okay, I am going to show you the whole idea behind Lagrangian mechanics. And so this is an example of this ball rolling on this track would be something that would be similar to what you would use it for, but we'll get into that. Let's get started. So this is Newtonian mechanics. Um, Newtonian mechanics can be used to solve problems like this oscillating mass uh, on a spring. The key thing is that for this mass, I can calculate the forces. At every instant in time, I can calculate the force. In this case, it would be the gravitational force pulling down and the spring force pulling up. And yeah, the spring force is not constant, but I can still calculate it. Once I calculate the forces, I can find the acceleration. I can just say, using the normal uh, ideas of physics, Newtonian physics. And then I can use this acceleration to find the equation of motion by integrating. Uh, and so this is this is the equation of motion. This, this is what you do. You find F net and you either set that to dp dt or mass times acceleration. But once you get that expression for acceleration, you can integrate to find the velocity. You can integrate that to find the position. And it may be tough to do, okay? But you can do it. You can get something, some expression for the acceleration. Once you do that, you're pretty much done. What about a situation like this? This is a pendulum. The ball is swinging back and forth. Okay, you've seen that before, I'm sure. Uh, so let's think about how you would solve this problem with Newtonian mechanics. And you, a lot of people do. It's in a lot of the introductory books, okay? But it's a lot more difficult than you think. So there's two forces acting on this ball. There is the downward gravitational force on the ball, which you can calculate. But then there's this tension force from the string, and you can't calculate the tension. I mean, you can, but you don't have an equation for the tension. There's no, there's no tension equation. It's not a calculated force. Uh, instead, how you would solve this problem, one way is to say, I'm going to use polar coordinates. And in polar coordinates, I have the angular position of the ball. And I can say that the distance, the, the r value of the polar coordinates doesn't change, it's constant. And if I do that, I can just look at the motion in the theta hat direction. So I can find, in that case, t doesn't do anything. So I can just ignore it. And then I can find the component of the gravitational force in the theta direction, which in theta changes, uh, and boom, you get this. So you have to know something about the uh, acceleration in polar coordinates. So, so that makes it a little bit more complicated and still not a trivial problem. I mean, it's covered a lot. It's not a trivial problem. Okay, what about this problem? And that's not a perfect double pendulum, I get it, but here's a double pendulum, a pendulum on a pendulum. How would you do that? Okay, so here's here's the two masses at some position. I have the downward gravitational force on the bottom mass, and then I have the tension on the bottom mass. And so that makes it look like it's just like a single pendulum, but it's not. It's not because that top mass is moving in a circle so that there's no constant pivot point for this bottom thing. It's not moving in a circle. So you can't do the same idea. It, you're trapped, okay? And then I have the downward force on the top mass, and then I have two tensions on that one. And, and so this is, I, I don't know how you would even go about, I guess you could. You could do something about energy to find the velocities and then find the velocities and the positions to find the circular acceleration, it would be pretty tough. I think you could possibly do it, but it would be tough. So now we are in the position where how do you deal with these forces of constraint in a situation like this? And the answer is Lagrangian mechanics. And you can see it's really a big deal because I wrote it big, right? Okay. So let's get, so we have Newtonian mechanics. I just want to review. That's where you use the forces, mostly you use the force and find the force and maybe a trick to find the acceleration. Lagrangian does it a different way. So we can define the Lagrangian as T minus U. So T is the kinetic energy, and we use T because uh, I think that comes from the French word for kinetic energy. It's like mechanical work. That, that's what they called kinetic energy, and it starts with a T in French or something. So that's why there's a T for kinetic energy. Uh, and then U is the potential energy. So T in Cartesian coordinates would be one half mass times the x velocity squared plus the y velocity squared plus the z velocity squared. And I'm using uh, x dot to represent the derivatives with respect to time. And then the potential could be a potential that depends on the position uh, and the time. So we want to do this and calculate the Lagrangian for a simple situation. So imagine that I throw a ball in the air. Then Lagrangian mechanics says that if you calculate the Lagrangian, the path that the ball takes 
is such that the, the path minimizes the action. This is the principle of least action, where that action is the integral over time of the Lagrangian. And I know that seems kind of weird, okay? So I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to calculate the action for different paths for this ball in one dimension, okay? That's what I'm going to do right here. So on the left is a ball thrown in the air. It's y versus time, but it has different, they're different parabolas. And I just chose parabolas because that would make it a little bit easier. Um, and so the different problems have different accelerations. And as I move up, they all end at the same point in time, but they have different initial velocities and different um, accelerations. But the key here is that these are different paths. I know position one and position two in world space, y versus t. On the right is a calculation of the path integral, the least action, the action. That's the action. And you see down there where, um, the minimum that is, that's the one that the re the ball would really fall through. Okay, so and then we can calculate that action as the integral of Lagrangian dt from t1 to t dt2. That's how we do it. And we but the thing is, we want to find the function the that for y that minimizes this integral. So we don't want to minimize the function. We want to minimize what find what function minimizes the integral. So this is where we go into the review of calculus of variations. This is all about the calculus of variations. So imagine that I have some point uh, x1, y1, and I want to do some path integral to x2, y2, and I want to integrate that in some way. I'm just calling it j, and it's a function of y, y prime, and x. So it turns out that if you want to find the this is not technically, oh, and here, uh, y dot, like I said before, in this case, y dot is a derivative of y with respect to x, but we'll change that to time because we can do whatever we want. No one can stop us. Uh, if you want to find the function that, that minimizes the integral, then you would have to use the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is this right here. This, if the function satisfies this equation, the partial of f with respect to y minus the derivative with respect to time of the partial of f with respect to y prime, then that's a stationary state. So that means it's either a maximum integration to an integral or a minimum. Okay, but we're going to assume it's going to be the minimum. But that's the Euler-Lagrange equation, and you can use that to find the, uh, the shortest distance between two points in flat space. You could do the shortest distance between two points on a sphere and show that it's a great circle. You could do the brachistochrome problem, which is the path a particle under the gravitational influence would take to take the least amount of time, not the shortest distance. And those are all calculus variations. So in Lagrangian mechanics, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pick some coordinates, because uh, we don't have to use Cartesian coordinates. We can do whatever we want. And once we do that, and that's one of the things that makes Lagrangian so powerful, from that, we're going to find the, uh, the kinetic energy function and the potential energy function, and then find the Lagrangian t minus u. From that, we'll use the Euler-Lagrange equation for L in as many dimensions as we need. If it's a one-dimensional problem, we'll only have one Euler-Lagrange equation. Then we'll get stuff. And the stuff here, ideally, we'd like to get something like the, the derivative, the second derivative of one of the uh, coordinates. That would be like the acceleration. And then from there, you can integrate and find whatever, whatever you need. So it looks like this in generic coordinates. Uh, the Lagrangian says the partial of L with respect to one of the coordinates, Q, minus the time derivative, d dt, of the partial of L with respect to Q dot. Okay, so Q could be x, it could be y, it could be theta, it could be anything. Okay, I'm going to do this for two problems. And we're going to work this through to start off with two simple problems. First, that motion of the ball. So I'm going to take that ball and throw it up in the air like this. Uh, so let's let's use Lagrangian on here. Even though it's trivial, we could do this without Lagrangian. So the kinetic energy would be one half m y dot squared, and the potential energy would be m g y. That's just the gravitational potential. So the Lagrangian would be t minus u one half m y dot squared minus m g y. Now, the first thing I'm going to want to do is just take the, deriv the partial derivative of L with respect to Y. And that one's pretty easy because there's, there's only one Y term in here. I don't have to worry about the 1 half M Y dot squared. That I don't, the kinetic energy doesn't depend on Y. So if I do that, I just get negative MG. Now I'm going to take the partial of L with respect to Y dot. That, again, is pretty easy. I don't have to worry about the term with the Y in it because it's a partial derivative. So I just get M Y dot. 
now I can take the derivative with respect to time, not the partial, the derivative of L with respect to, of the partial of L with respect to Y dot with respect to time. And I get M, the M is constant, so it doesn't, doesn't change. So the derivative of Y dot with respect to time is Y double dot. Now I can put that in the, in the Euler-Lagrange equation and I get negative MG minus MY double dot equals zero or MG equals MY dot double dot and the acceleration is g, which, yeah, we already knew that, right? Okay, so, but you know, you, you got to start off with a problem that you already know the answer to, to make sure you know what you're doing. And so this one, yeah, it does work. Well, let's do the pendulum problem again. So here's the pendulum problem, and I want to use the Lagrangian. Now, in this case, I don't have to use x and y. I mean, you could solve this problem with x and y, but it's actually pretty tough. Instead, I'm going to use this coordinate theta. Uh, one of the powerful things about Lagrangian is that you can pick any kind of coordinate system that you want to describe the position of the objects. It doesn't even have to be a real coordinate. Okay. Um, so I'm picking theta. The string has a length lowercase l. I did this problem in class with uppercase l and that was a mistake because it looked like the Lagrangian. I want to find the kinetic energy. So the first thing I'm going to do is I need this uh, y position of the ball, it's going to be negative L cosine theta. So in this case, I'm calling Y in the upward direction. A lot of people would say positive Y is down to make it easier, but I'm doing it this way because I want to be legitimate. Okay, So that's just the uh, adjacent side of that right triangle, and then the X component is going to be L times the sine theta for the opposite side of the, uh, the triangle. Let me start with the potential energy because it's easy. Potential is mgy, and now I just put in my value for y, and I get negative L, mgl cosine theta. That's easy. Now, but what about the kinetic energy? I have this angle theta, and I don't know how to write the kinetic energy in terms of that. I could do it in polar coordinates, but what if I don't know how to do that? What if it's not a real coordinate? Well, as long as I can get theta, or in terms of the real uh, Cartesian coordinates, x and y, I know uh, the kinetic energy in Cartesian coordinates is one half m x dot squared plus y dot squared. Well, now I just need to take the derivatives of x and y with respect to time, and I can do that. So the derivative of x with respect to time is going to be L cosine theta, because it's L's constant. Sine theta, the derivative of that's cosine theta, and that's wrong. Because this is the mistake I always made as an undergraduate. You have to also, it's a derivative right? It's not a partial. So I have to also take the derivative of the inside of cosine theta, which is theta. So the derivative of theta with respect to time is theta dot. So you have to have that theta dot in there also. Theta dot. There it is. Um, so now I have x dot. Now let's do the same thing for y dot. Uh, y dot's the derivative of L cosine theta, so I get negative L sine theta. I also need to take the derivative of that uh, theta with respect to time, so I get theta dot. Now if I put that in for my kinetic energy, I get t equals 1 half m, and then I have the x dot squared plus the y dot squared. I can factor out an l squared and a theta dot squared, and I'm left with cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which is 1. So I get, I get just 1 half m l squared theta dot squared. Now from that, I can put that into the Lagrangian, t minus u is just going to be 1 half m l squared theta dot squared plus, right, because there's a minus in there. It's actually minus a minus, mg l cosine theta. Okay, now I need to take my partial derivatives and my actual derivatives. So let's start with, there's my l that I had from before, my Lagrangian. The partial of l with respect to theta is going to be negative mg l sine theta. And I don't have, I have a partial theta with respect to theta too, right, because I have to take the derivative of that, but that's just one. So I don't have to put that down. Now the partial of L with respect to theta dot, uh, it's just a power rule, so I could bring the two down, the two cancels with the one, the one half, and I get M L squared theta dot. Now I need to take the derivative of that with respect to time, and again, the only thing that depends on time here is theta dot, so I just get theta double dot. Now I wanna put it in the Euler-Lagrange equation uh, with theta, and I just get negative mgl sine theta minus ml squared theta double dot squared equals zero, and I can move stuff to the other side and solve for theta dot, and I get that. Theta double dot equals negative g over l 
Signed, Data. Identical. I put that in there. So that it's identical to the Newtonian method, right? I mean, if if I if I do it a different way, reality, I know how that thing's going to move. So it kind of has to use to agree with that. So it's the same thing. And again, this is not the best problem for Lagrangian. It's way more powerful than this. But I'm starting off with an idea of how this works. Okay, so when would you use Lagrangian? Number one is if you have forces of constraint. If you can calculate all the forces, you can calculate the acceleration. You don't need this. Okay, but in situations where the particle is constrained or the object is constrained in some way and you don't know what those forces are, then Lagrangian works really well for that. This works well for generalized coordinates where you just make up your own coordinate system. It doesn't have to be Cartesian. It doesn't have to be polar. It can be any variable that describe the situation. And I will do some problems like that where we just pick whatever we want. Okay. Uh, one of the things with the generalized coordinates is you want to look at how many degrees of freedom the system has. So if it if it's just moving in how many numbers, how many variables would you need to completely describe the situation? For the pendulum, I just need one, right? The double pendulum, I would need two. I would need an angle for the first one and an angle for the second one. And that angle, here's that generalized coordinate. The angle for the bottom mass can be with respect to the top mass, which is not constant. But who cares? It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, so, but I, that numbers, that degrees of freedom tell me how many Lagrangian equations, uh, Euler Lagrange equations I'm going to have. Uh, if in some cases you may want to over uh, define the system, I have too many coordinates, and then have a equation of constraint that relates those coordinates to each other. And I'm going to do an example like that too, but that does happen, and there will be many more examples to come. But I just want to give you a good start on Lagrangian. It's a really different way of thinking about things, and it takes some practice to get used to it. So if, you, if it does make sense yet, that's cool. You're going to it, you just have to do a lot of problems, and we'll get through it. And I'm going to I'm going to do a whole bunch of Lagrangian problems, and it's going to be awesome. Oh, we can also do things like uh, find the equation of constraint. We can include friction. Those are things that we can do later on. But let's just do some plain problems first. I'll talk to you guys later.